This is the second act of your presentation, and we move from one end of the commodity chain to the other end. We've heard about mining in uh, a number of places. We've heard about the strange combination of visibility and invisibility. If you ever thought one thing couldn't be visible and invisible at the same time, well, you have not heard of phosphorus. But now we jump to the other end of the commodity chain. Who's actually using this stuff? With what purpose? What is the mindset? Now I should confess from the very beginning here that I'll be painting with a very broad brush here, uh, and I'll go against the natural instinct of any good historian, which is to be specific to places and uh, people. Now you've seen Anna, being an anthropologist, doesn't have much of a problem with that. I'm a historian, so I always want to be as specific as uh, possible, and there's a huge literature on individual places all over the world, and for good reasons. And many of these studies start with, let's first of all talk about the local specifics. Now, I will make an effort to switch off that little voice in my head here and really talk about farming and phosphates in the most general term. A farmer, as understood in this presentation, is any person engaged in agriculture, be it men or women, landowners, peasants, or even landless workers. And I think it is rewarding to look beyond these individual stories towards the common challenges that farmers were wrestling with all over the globe. The notion of the plantation scene may serve as a reminder that there is indeed quite a lot that unites agricultural people around the globe. And the topic of discussion, phosphorus, is certainly a good point of departure. The situation of agriculturalists all over the world is remarkably similar, not identical, but similar, when we look at how they dealt with fertilizer and plant nutrition needs. I shall first start this presentation by explaining the allusion that is in my title here that alludes to Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, um, one of the classics of gonzo journalism. Now, for those who have not read the book, uh, the text, originally published in Rolling Stone magazine in 1971, chronicles a truly weird drug fuel journey to Las Vegas, where the narrator chases the American dream, or what's left of it, now, those who do know the book will surely agree that the word weird is actually a pretty weak one as a description for what is happening there. It's clearly a vertigo-inducing narrative, and quite intentionally so. Now, it may seem quite a stretch to bring a narrative that plays out mostly in bars, casino, and hotel rooms to bear on the discussion of phosphorus. And at the risk of stating the obvious, there is no reference to phosphorus or agriculture or the plantation of scene in Thompson's book but I think there are three points we can take from this book. It is a book about addiction and the consequences. And if you look at the farmers and the reliance on phosphorus all over the globe, you can't help but wonder about dependencies. The number of drug users who gave up on drugs is probably larger than the number of farmers who gave up on phosphorus. My second point, Thompson's masterpiece reminds us that what goes on in the head is just as important as what goes on in the material world. The history of phosphorus and mineral fertilizers is also about hopes, illusions, and painful learning processes. And third, I think one of the most remarkable features of the global phosphorus apparatus is that it seems to make very few people happy. And there's also very little happiness in this little book. Now, this approach helps us to move beyond what is the standard story about the merits of phosphorus uh, which has to do with the uh, gentleman you see here uh, on, th on the right, that is uh, Justus von Liebig, a name that you already heard about the Ger German 19th century chemists. And the conventional wisdom in agricultural circles is that Liebig revolutionized our understanding of plant nutrition and put the discipline on a sound foundation. And you wouldn't guess what kind of trouble you get into when you challenge that narrative. There is free speech in Germany, but not when it comes to Liebig. Now, there is of course, some point in this narrative. There is going to see Liebig and the generation of scientists that he represents as a watershed um, in, uh, modern, in the history of modern science. Liebig and his associates pointed out that plant growth relied on the availability of a number of chemical nutrients, and their teaching replaced what Stephen Stahl, an agricultural historian, has called dunghill doctrines, which is basically a mix of experiences, intuition, and the Hamas theory that ultimately goes back to Aristotle. 
But at the end of the day, Liebig did not have the answer to all questions, or to be more precise, he had answers to some questions, and he opened some new ones. Now we can see that by looking at the most famous illustration of Liebig's uh, teaching that you see here on the uh, left, the uh, Liebig ton, uh, which is a wooden barrel with uh, staves of different length, and these individual staves symbolize the different nutrients that a plant needs. And the idea is that uh, nutrients are available in variable amounts in the soil, and the nutrient that is the scarce this uh, defines the limit of plants growth, the law of the minimum, Arno has mentioned it already, and just as a symbol, just as the shortest stave defines how much water a barrel can hold. Now that's a very powerful way, I think, to um, teach the essentials of plant nutrition, but if you look at this from the point of view of a farmer, that's not the end of our questions. For someone planting crops, and wondering about fertilizer need, the key questions were about nutrients needed and the desired amount. Now, how do you recognize the minimum factor and uh, what do you do in order to increase this factor and to gain, if you stick with the metaphor, a longer stave that allows the barrel to hold more water? The Liebig ton did not provide an answer and neither did the teachings of agrochemistry. Throughout the 19th century and far into the 20th century, agrochemistry lacked methods to give farmers precise instructions as to crop fertilizer use. So as a result, contrary to the big myth of Liebig as the big watershed, farmers were actually quite lukewarm about mineral fertilizer throughout the 19th century. Some were using them, um, entrepreneurial farmers in particular, but they were certainly not a majority. And even in Liebig's home country, Germany, mineral fertilizer didn't really become a standard part of farming routines until about 1900, depending on the region that you're in but there is my little voice again here. Now, anyway, uh, the, the key point is that the, the, the key goal of agrochemistry until uh, the early 1900s is really uh, just to make the case that there is a good reason to use fertilizer. And one of the ways in which they were uh, doing this uh, was by fertilizer experiments. This picture shows one of these fertilizer experiments, and I'm, I'm sure you're struck by the sheer simplicity of this. You know, even a child can see that with Thomas Meal means more abundant harvest than uh, without. And even a child can see the difference here. That's as simple as it is. Of course, things are not uh, that simple. For one thing, a farmer would want to know, well, how much of a dose uh, do I need to put into the field to get this kind of difference? And how much does it cost? Does it justify the outlay of capital? In fertilizer matters, as in so many things, God was in the details. Now, we. Stick to this picture for a minute. It's interesting to see uh, that it advertised Thomas Meal, Thomas Meal of Deutsch, um, which uh, is um, a, a fertilizer with uh, phosphorus as the uh, key nutrient. So this picture is actually about treating the merits of phosphorus, except it doesn't say so. It boosts a specific product, and that mirrors something that I think you need to be aware of when you talk about fertilizers. There's an enormous degree of infighting among the producers of fertilizers. We've heard that for the uh, uh, case of Morocco and the Sahara, but it's uh, uh, just the same closer to uh, the fields where fertilizers are used. Um, now, Liebig's ton really was about preaching that uh, there is a need for a balance of nutrient, but the fertilizer business was not so much about balance. It was about market share, and many producers acted really as if this were kind of a zero-sum uh, game where each gain get went at the expense of uh, another uh, party. Now, that didn't make sense in terms of plant nutrition, but it did make commercial sense, and it found a reflection in a bewildering set of conflicting advice. Many fertilizer producers set up their own research institutes, academic journals, and networks of advisors, and that left its mark in academia. There was and is no truly independent science of mineral fertilizer uh, ever since the day of Liebig, who himself, by the way, had investments in the fertilizer business. So what you see in German agriculture and many other Western uh, countries is a learning process that spans several generations. Farmers gradually came to embrace mineral fertilizer as part of their routine of agriculture, and the amount that they were using slowly, slowly increased. What did not increase in a similar fashion was the wisdom 
of agrochemistry. Agrochemistry, again, was not in a position to give authoritative advice on dosage and optimum uses on nutrients. And that has simply to do with the fact that the soil is a pretty difficult uh, entity to deal with. It's actually quite difficult to study the concentration of nutrients in the soil and um, every chemical analysis, if you, even if you have a good methods, uh, only provides a snapshot. Soils are living organisms, so the concentration of available nutrients changes uh, over the growing season. And all that agrochemistry was offering was really only an educated guess. So what you see in these short remarks is that Liebig and his pupils really looked at plant nutrition in a very narrow way because the fertile soil was really more than a temporary storage place for nutrients on the way from the mine or the factory to the crop. And to be clear, this is not the wisdom of hindsight. For example, Albert Howard, an English bot botanist who is now celebrated as a pioneer of organic farming, rallied what's what he called the NPK mentality in uh, 1940, NPK standing for the key three key nutrients that you all heard, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and probably took no academic degree to meet the disposal of mineral fertilizer with a good, good ghost of skepticism. Because the people who set up this experiment, they didn't just do this to teach the farmers a lesson. They did this for commercial pr purposes. They wanted to sell something, and, and the more, the better. And being a bit skeptical there is a matter of common sense. But then there is a critical question. Was there a different, better, more sophisticated approach? Well, there was but they were more complicated than the teachings of agrochemistry. Now, for the sake of brevity, I will only quote one of those uh, critics, Jim Scott, the director of the Agrarian Studies Program at Yale University, who wrote in his widely acclaimed book, Seeing Like a State of 1999, and I quote, an effective soil science must not stop at chemical nutrients. It must encompass elements of physics, bacteriology, entomology, and geolog geology, and that is the minimum. Now, Scott has a very good point here, it's also a pretty terrifying statement if you look at it through the lens of somebody who wants to gain expertise in this field. How many academics do you know who have degrees in chemistry, physics, bacteriology, etymology, and geology? The modern world of science is reductionist and thrives on disciplinary specialization, and that spelled trouble for a discipline like soil science that thrived on disciplinarity. Now, again, there is this little voice in my head that says, you know, say something about the specifics, say something about, you know, Thomas Mio. It's a great topic to speak about in Germany. It's a quintessential Central European nutrient, basically uh, slag from steel production uh, from iron ore that has an, uh, significant amounts of phosphorus uh, in it. But for all the local, regional, national specifics, there is one thing you can say generally about fertilizer use in the 19th and 20th century. Agrochemistry was not the most sophisticated approach to soil fertility. It was the approach that fared best in a capitalist agriculture that focused on short-term gains. Unlike other methods of maintaining soil fertility, mineral fertilizer worked quickly. It brought relatively light work, especially when you compare it to manuring technique. Labor issues are very important in uh, many parts of the world. And it was less complicated than alternatives. Many farmers surely felt that things were probably a bit more complicated than the friendly fertil fertilizer people suggested, then farmers had to worry about many things in the modern world. So the victory of mineral fertilizer was the victory of easy and simplistic over realistic and complex. So the story of phosphorus on the farm is not about a demand that was simply a given. Demands are cultural constructions and their mirror conditions in economy and society. It was about the situation of people on the farm who typically had little training and little time. It was about the power of corporate capitalism. As fertilizer became big business, companies left their marks on the questions academics were asking and the questions academics were not asking. And it was about fear as people on the farm were pondering thoughts about potential alternatives. Surely, buying phosphorus was expensive, and trusting fertilizer people was a leap of faith. But what if you tried up by yourself and screwed up? So for those who sought alternatives to high-input farming, 
information and advice was and is scarce. Now, the artifact of choice uh, that you already see on the other uh, screen there, but now you get a double bag of nitro fosca gold here uh, on the screen. A bag of nitro fosca fertilizer mirrors this ambiguity of uh, agrochemistry. It mirrored, among other things, the corporate heavyweights that were entering the fertilizer business in the 20th century. Nitro Fosca was introduced in 1927, and the producer is a company that I think most of you will know, one of the infamous, most infamous companies in German history, IG Farben. And Nitro Fosca was a multinutrient fertilizer, something you've already seen uh, in uh, 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 Greg's uh, picture. There's also a magic uh, number here, meaning the amount uh, of the different nutrients that is in here, a fixed ratio of the three key nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And the message to farmers was, well, if you use this, you will have roughly the right composition. In other words, do not fear and do use nitrofosca. Now, of course, a fixed uh, ratio of nutrients ignored the specific needs of individual fields. But that was beside the point. The goal was not to use phosphorus as best one could. The goal was what one might call fail-safe fertilizer use. Nitrofosca was not optimum resource use, but you couldn't make much of a mistake when you used it, well, at least in the short term. And invoking a theme from the technosphere, one might say that the use of phosphorus on the farm was about acting as if there was no tomorrow. So in other words, the waste of nutrients that went along with nitrofosca was not you know, some unfortunate side effect. It was part of the business plan. And nitrofosca is around now for 88 years. And so you can see it fills a need among users, if only for lack of something better. Now, so far I've centered this discussion on Western countries, the rationale being simply that Western countries were the first ones to introduce mineral fertilizer on a uh, a grand uh, scale with uh, some exceptions that I can go into um, here. But of course, what I'm talking about here is a global practice nowadays. The use of mineral fertilizer is a global technique. And I think you can grasp a little bit of the brutality of the Green Revolution in light of what I've said here. The process that I talked about for Germany for several generations occurs almost overnight. Uh, in the global south, with a seed and fertilizer package basically being dumped into the lap of farmers in a manner of take it or leave it. Many farmers did take the leap of faith, and they accepted the dependencies that go with this. Fertilizer was the first experience of farmers becoming reliant on outside advisors and listening to uh, advice that I cannot really check properly, and that went on. It went on with the seed companies. It went on with the pesticides and with the herbicides. And we can see what the result of these dependencies is. Hunter Thompson survived his Las Vegas drug binge and lived on in spite of its his uh, addiction. But many farmers could not live with the dependencies that phosphorus and other supplies brought to the farm. The number of Indian farmers who committed suicide over the last quarter century is in the range of the total number of German farm owners. Now, saying all this, we shouldn't gloss over one uh, important fact. The use of mineral fertilizer has helped to boost yields per acre, and it's difficult to see how we can feed the planet if we stop to use mineral fertilizer altogether. But then, fertilizer use is not a matter of all or nothing. There are alternatives, and we need to uh, reflect on them, difficult as it may be. And the quest for alternatives is not just about users. It needs to take a, a multitude of parties into along the commodity chain into account, and it needs to engage not only with material practices, but also with mindsets. We need to understand the worlds that people live in, both materially and conceptually. We need to understand their hopes and their fears. And I think it's possible to envision a global cy prosperous cycle that is less wasteful and more sustainable, but we need to bring that idea into a dialogue with the minds of the stakeholder. And as you probably see by the sequence of these two acts, the global phosphorus cycle as it stands is as much about connecting people as it is about separating them. Those who buy phosphorus for their farm do not engage with those who produce phosphorus, not because they don't care, 
but because of a hassle here. Now there's one final thought that I would like to uh, bring across here by way of concluding uh, this uh, talk. Um, I hope I can convince you that looking at this through the metaphor of addiction gives us a deeper understanding of what phosphorus is about. Drug use is rarely an isolated problem in people's life, and so is the use of phosphorus. It is deeply ingrained in supply chains, network expertise, and habits of the users, and any effort to change will need to engage with a multitude of challenges. And yet, this presentation would not be complete without a word on the mindset of those who live outside the world of agriculture, which probably includes the lion's share of the audience, including myself. If we talk about phosphorus used as a type of addiction, there is a grave danger that we embrace the simple morals that people have often embraced about addicts. Like drug addicts, farmers have typically received any amount of scorn and discrimination, but that has really helped in dealing with their addiction. In fact, morals have deprived addicts of a voice, suggesting that we, they know they have nothing of substance to say on the matter. But as we know, addicts are painfully aware of their situation, of the dependencies they're trapped in, and the elusiveness of alternatives. And we can make a similar point about the farmer. When you talk to a farmer about phosphorus, you may hear about yields, but you will also hear about material and financial dependencies and a sense of entrapment. And the question is whether we want to hear about that. Thank you very much.